Welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Carlidge. I know that you're here because you want to master your animal training skills using a force-free approach. And to handle the variety of challenges you face, you need a broad knowledge and experience base. The problem is we all get stuck and hit rough patches in our training, which can leave us feeling overwhelmed and helpless. Our mission since 2015 is to empower trainers just like you. The Animal Training Academy has helped thousands of trainers globally to develop skills, gain confidence, and positively influence both animal and human learners. Here's how we can do the same for you. Sign up for our membership waitlist at www.atamember.com. Register when our doors open, email arrives, and start growing your training skills. Build impactful training practices, benefiting you and those you train. So join the waitlist at www.atamember.com. And while waiting, enjoy this free podcast show. We want to see you avoid embarrassment, overwhelm, and burnout. Instead, We want to see you build resilience to setbacks, get more organized, and grow your training skills and knowledge. In short, we want to see you enjoy confidence in yourself as a trainer and lead a fulfilling life, positively impacting the lives of the animal and human learners you work with. Welcome to today's episode of the Animal Training Academy podcast show, where we help you master your personal animal training skills using a force-free approach. I'm thrilled to introduce our special guest, Jim Mackey, Animal Behaviour Management Officer at ZSL London Zoo. Jim Mackey has been a vital part of the Zoological Society of London for 24 years, becoming its first Animal Behaviour Management Officer in 2013. In charge of training and behaviour at both London and Whipsnade zoos, he has ushered in evidence-based techniques, replacing traditional restraint methods. Jim chaired the Biaza Animal Training and Behaviour Working Group until 2022 and is vice chair of the IAZA Training Group. He's also an IAZA Academy instructor, focusing on trained behaviour to enhance welfare in zoos and aquaria. Known for lectures and workshops, both locally and internationally, Jim is a recognised leader in ethical animal training. Without further delay then, let's welcome Jim to the show. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today at Animal Training Academy. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back. Literally sitting on the other side of the world in London. Uh, I can see it getting dark out your window there while the sun's just coming up here in New Zealand. We appreciate you taking time out of your evening. Jim, we know our listeners are passionate about, as mentioned, mastering animal training through a force-free approach. They they seek a broad knowledge and experience base, but sometimes they face challenges that can feel stressful and overwhelming. Here at Animal Training Academy, we aim to empower them to positively impact the lives of both animals and humans. And I'm really excited about today's episode because you've certainly had extensive experience in this field, working with creatures ranging from arapaima fish to zebras and everything in between at ZSL London since 1999. Your insights into overcoming challenges make you an ideal guest for today's topic. So let's dive in, Jim. I can't wait to hear what you think uh, the five biggest challenges trainers face in zoos and how they overcome them. Can you get us started, please, with number one? Well, the, the very first thing that um, any zookeeper will tell you is that there um, there's limits in the amount of time that you can spend training. Um, zookeepers have so many different responsibilities and um, quite a lot of pressures on their time. And so um, so trying to find the time to fit in their training programs can be um, a little bit problematic. And I think if you were to ask any zookeeper, that would be the, the number one challenge they probably immediately think about um, when they were 
you know, when they were thinking about the things that potentially get in the way um, of their training programs. So you're you're a keeper at a zoo or you're just a trainer out of a zoo training domestic animals because this is a this is a universal problem I would say but but the thing about a trainer in a zoo you're listening to this podcast you're attending Biaza and Yaza courses or equivalent courses in your region of the world and your managers are going to conferences and telling you you need to do this training they're bringing in experts to your zoo and you're going to these workshops in your zoo setting and you've been given training projects but what's challenging is that all of that's really exciting but what are you now not doing because you're doing training training has to fit in somewhere how how does that make how does that feel for your in your experience how does how do trainers feel when they come up against the expectations of managers their motivation to implement training and the reality of finite resources yeah i mean it's um i think it's a really um yeah, like you say, it's a universal subject for everybody. Um, and I think that what happened in the past was that a lot of uh, keepers would choose to train maybe in their own time. So they might train in their lunch break or maybe stay on after work just to fit it in um, if it wasn't part of an accepted culture within the section that they're working on. Um, I do think times have changed. You know, I think that um, in a lot of zoos that I work um, you know, or help out with and work in myself. Um, there is this this approach now that means that training is part of the accepted management strategy, if you like, animal management strategy of that um, institution. And I know how that feels for for zookeepers. Um, it feels like quite a lot of pressure, and it also feel like, oh, am I am I missing out on doing all the other things I'm supposed to be doing, and um, and just focusing on this one thing? So. What I'd like to share straight away is that um, to take a little bit of the pressure, the feeling of pressure off of the zookeeper, um, is to remember that training isn't about quantity. It can be equally as effective when you do fewer training sessions and less frequent. I think there's this drive to do as much training as you possibly can, maybe do a 20-minute session or a, or do three sessions a day. But in actuality, um, effective training can happen pretty fast and you can reduce the frequency and duration of sessions and actually get better results. So I think that's one thing to share straight away is to is to think about um, quality over quantity as one of the potential solutions for feeling that pressure. Why why do you think that pressure exists? Is it why why do you think people feel like quantity is important? Is that is that something that's coming across in what people are learning or is that the skill sets of beginner trainers paired with the behaviors they're trying to train and how quickly they can access reinforcement, that reinforcement being the behavior change of their animals? Does that make sense? It certainly does. And I think you've hit one of the reasons why um, that pressure does build up and which is my was going to be my next point actually which i think is uh, really interesting that you you raise that there which is i think what we need to think about if we're talking about um quality over quantity is the effectiveness of the trainer and um that's something that you know uh, so many people are trying to work towards now with the um different courses that are run um, the institutional uh, continual personal development programs that are now being written into a lot of the um, policies um, of zoos. And I think this is really important. If you if you can be a more effective trainer by upskilling your staff, at, you know, have, have an institution that has a, across the board has keepers that have training skill sets as part of their toolbox, then that can definitely reduce the amount of errors and therefore reduce the amount of time, meaning that um, the keepers will, like you say, gain the reinforcement of uh, of success in their training programs far quicker. And I think that's what we need to work towards. But I also feel like, you know, we can build training programs into our daily management routines as well. And I think that if we just were able to think about the um, percentage of, of your time budget that 
that can be spent training, which could be as little as, you know, one, two percent of the animal's day and of your kind of uh, working with that individual animal, then it could could make it more manageable. And um, and I think that's uh, that's something to be considered. And especially, you know, I think us humans, we need our routines. And if we can factor in training as uh, one particular individual or a particular species at this time of the day and then another one a little bit later, maybe making up three training sessions over a five day period, then then I think it can become much more manageable and fit into most people's um, time budgets in terms of their workload. But of course, every institution is different, and with staff shortage, it's quite an, quite a, um, an area that we need to consider when we're when we're building in these routines into our uh, into our daily management. Well, let's get a little bit broader then for for the zoo employed trainer, which is synonymous with keeper now in twenty twenty three. Uh, it always has been, but is becoming the clarity around that, I would say, and the, is becoming more clear and the fog is decreasing around the difference between those two terms. But you're you're listening to this and you're thinking, okay, cool. All I've got to do is these little sessions uh, as opposed to what I've been thinking, which is I've got to carve out significant chunks of time to fit this into my already very busy schedule. How, how does, how do, what are the approximations between listening to this episode and actually becoming practically effective at implementing training sessions that are going to yield behavior change in the direction we want? And, and, and is that the most important thing? Is there, is there a pairing there of, You've got to practically apply this and build your own skills sometimes, which is a separate goal than the behavior change of your animal. You also have to become skilled at implementing the tools of the trade. Does that make sense? It does. And um, and I think the answer is is actually the same on both counts, both for the person and for the animal, which is... If you are a relatively inexperienced trainer that's coming into um, a situation where you're being expected to train quite quite invasive behaviours in, in the zoo world, a lot of our training is really focused in on, you know, improving welfare through um, veterinary cooperation, for example, you know, cooperative care. And a lot of that is um, potentially quite difficult to train because it can be painful for the animal when they experience those um, things like hand injections and blood draws. And they are the top end of the um, of the training, you know, the behaviour change that we want to be um, teaching our animals. And so, for me, a really a really kind of easy solution for this is is to train very simple behaviours and learn that way. And so, the you know, every zoo has a slightly different approach to what is a foundation behaviour. But we um, consider foundation behaviours as you know, maybe observable and measurable calm behavior when the animal is in close proximity. Then we might do some simple targeting orientation uh, behaviors, or we might do sitting still, st- stationing or shifting. And all these simple foundation behaviors can both serve to um, provide the trainer with very quick reinforcers of success because they're relatively easy for the animals to um, to learn. And they give those animals the coping skills and prerequisite behaviours that they're going to need for those um, more invasive, potentially uh, more welfare-focused behaviours in the future. And so I think that's a really good starting point. And I think that this all ties in with the the feeling of pressure that I was talking about before, about trying to hit targets um, that are potentially really kind of out of reach for the relatively inexperienced trainer. And I think that's um, that's to do with wanting to do the best thing you can for your animals every single day. But the best thing for the animal is often to simplify things, to take it back to the basics and just think about those, as I say, prerequisite skills and build those up. Learn your craft, um, test your abilities by um, by teaching those simple behaviours. And that of course would have that uh, knock on effect of giving the trainer more and more confidence to become, you know, a more effective trainer going forward. How how are things over there in 
in Europe. I, I, and I, I, my understanding is that there, there's a lot of zoological organisations in in England and the European region. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I mean, um, in British and Irish zoos, there are hundreds, literally hundreds, in a relatively small area, you know, uh, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. We have, I think, well over 300 zoos and 120 of which belong to the umbrella organisation of the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria. So this is a, a vast number of zoos and every single one has a slightly different um level of where they are with their training programs that's just in britain and ireland when you look at iaza so the european association of zoos and aquaria you're looking at hundreds and hundreds more zoos and there is an even bigger um, variety in terms of the levels um, of where training is accepted practice is um you know is is used on a on a daily basis so yeah it's really really different over here and um and so many different organizations and what's the norm in terms of having a person of your position in an organization well it's very funny you should ask that because that was a question that was asked by a, a student over in um i believe it was in hungary who was trying to assess the amount of training or behavior officers coordinators uh curators if you like that work in um ers or institutions and um the the result was quite quite astonishing really there are just a handful there's lots of people that are responsible for training programs but it's not an exclusive role if that makes sense so instead of you know there might be a curator of um mammals or a curator of husbandry they might be a team leader or as a, you know a veterinarian um, but in terms of exclusively looking into training and or welfare and behavior there are approximately seven or eight in the whole of europe it just makes me think about the, the trainer who's tasked with implementing this stuff and that is once again becoming the norm more and more every year and inseparable from the, the, the title zookeeper trainer is part of the definition of what that means and most of them are in an organization without a formal recognition of a title like yours but there are people running these programs and who's training the people to create the programs uh to to train these staff uh and, I, and i'm just thinking about my experience and learning about this information going and implementing the some basic easy to train behaviors and then these and some individuals go back to their organization but they don't have a good learning partner a good non-human learning partner and so much as the species they are working with it's not as easily understandable uh i'm thinking about in australia working with koalas right and you learn about the abcs of behavior and you learn about positive reinforcement and then you go stand in front of a koala for somebody who's really new to this information they're going to be like, well, this doesn't apply here. And of course it does. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they're watching videos of cooperative care where these animals, species and individuals are really engaged. Um, and then they have this challenge of training those easy behaviours, doing short sessions with these species that uh, have a natural history, which brings to the table a lot of unique um, considerations. Or they have a species which is traditionally uh, thought to be a, a trainable species in terms of um, their natural history provides a good antecedent arrangement for training to occur, but the individual animals they have to work with are, are fearful or stressed or they're not having, they're, they're performing stereotypical behavior. So they're then trying to jump in with these individuals. Um, do you have any thoughts on how these people can build or have have like short periods of training in their routine and their daily routine uh, and, and how they can get the reinforcements they they need to maintain their behaviors which is uh, hypothetically uh success of their training programs does that make sense that was a long question yeah there's 
<laughs> thing there's, there's, there's like I, I, I kind of got three questions out of that. One of which was um, mentorship, which I think is a really interesting um, thing. Another is how who trains the in who trains the person that, that forms the program. So let me answer that firstly, and I think that's a that's a, a great point because you know there isn't really any formalized program to um to teach people that are expected to coordinate training well there wasn't until we wrote one for biaza and so um over the last 3 years we've been um accrediting zookeepers to be registered animal trainers so biaza our umbrella organization we partnered with a group called the animal behavior training council which i'm sure some of your members are also part of and they standardize training in the uk they set standards and criteria and so we wrote a program to help zookeepers learn how to train so the animal trainer um level is level um level three and we've just actually launched our level four which is the animal training instructor and so that is specifically designed to help the zookeeper that has already become a registered animal trainer to become a coordinator of animal training in their zoo. So our focus with that is how do you build the um, the institutional support and create a culture? How do you um, provide mentorship? What's it like to coach one-to-one and coach in a classroom? Can you write a curriculum for behaviour science and its application in the zoo? So um, that is a work in progress and if you ask me again next july when we finish that first version of the uh the ati uh, animal training instructor i'm hopeful we're going to have 10 people working in different institutions in the uk that have got those skills and got those tools and i feel like i've been really privileged in the last 10 years to go through that process and and you know learn from my own mistakes about how to set it up i've had amazing mentors of course like annetta peterson at copenhagen the key over in san diego zoo that already went through that before i did so i was able to tap into their knowledge um, but now we've created this program that hopefully will answer that question within biaza you know uh, but that's in the uk and ireland um beyond that um i'm sure it's still a major problem so that was the, the first question, if you like, and I think we are working towards uh, solving that problem if we can. Um, and then the mentorship, I think, is a really sound question because you're absolutely right. We're very, again, very lucky at um, ZSL where we've had this culture of training being part of our um, animal management strategy for 10 years and more, actually. And um, we just kind of formalized it in that time. And so every zookeeper has the opportunity to ask their colleague for support and advice plus they've got myself and they've got a lot of experienced trainers that work um un, you know for the organization so we're really privileged but not every zoo has that and that's why we build networks that's why you know something like the animal training academy is so important and so is the biaza animal behavior training working group facebook site and all these other networking opportunities so even though you might not be able to ask someone immediately next to you in your institution you know there's a network out there and they are present um and you're absolutely right about that question of you know that th it's double-edged isn't it you've got the the animal that is really tricky and one of our um, biaza animal trainer students last year jess up at edinburgh um, chose to train a um, sloth for their training uh, program, their, their assessment. And that was a really brave decision because a sloth is a bit like a koala in terms of that sedentary lifestyle. <laughs> and um, and the and the behavior she was uh, training was to be able to trim the claws of this, uh, this elderly animal. So, you know, that was uh, quite a challenge and she faced those challenges well, but was able to then, you know, rely on this network of us being able to support and do the one minute videos that um, me, Joe Mason and Susan Friedman were able to do. So this is this this is a really great way of, uh, of keeping people's motivation up when they're not seeing that instant success. Um, but but then you're absolutely right. And one of the one of the things I was going to talk about as as one of the the major challenges that we face in the zoo environment is fearful animals. That have had previous aversive experiences and um so maybe i'll come back to that question when we when we tackle that challenge if that's okay yeah absolutely uh i think the the other question i had is just to um keep it here for a moment is 
Good, and they, they were great answers, and uh, I really liked them. And, and I, I want to do the mentor, no, the trainer, what do you call it, the ATI? At, yeah, the animal training instructor, level four. Do you have to be in Europe to do that? Well, actually, you have to be in Britain or Ireland, and you have to work for a Biaza institution. So it's a very, unfortunately, it's a very elite and exclusive club, I'm afraid, Ryan. Um, oh, I have a British passport. That's fine. Come and work for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing we are trying to do, actually, is to try and roll that out beyond um, Biaza because it is, it's gained such a lot of um, positive publicity. Um, because of the the nature of it, and and you know it's, it's it's proven to be a really successful project. So we are exploring those avenues. Um, uh, Joe Mason and I, my co-teacher, um, along with the Biarza office. So we watch this space. You never know; it might be, and it's all online. So it's um, you know some something we could potentially roll out in the future. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and I think they would have a lot of interest. Can you can you share about a little bit more about what you cover in that program? Yeah, sure. So just like the um, the animal trainer level three, um, it's comprised of uh, 37 weeks and we do um, online sessions every week. And we're absolutely privileged to have some amazing uh, contributors with that. So it's not just Joe and I, we, we write the course and we teach the majority of it. But we also have um, Susan Friedman, who's a, a co-contributor and she joins us every single week um, to teach various subjects. And the the um the level three one we focus on you know obviously the basic skills and the prerequisites of foundations that Annette Peterson comes in and does guest lectures for we have Barbara Heidenreich um guest lecturing um on um various topics including the you know this the, the non-aversive use of negative reinforcement um and then in this uh, new course that we're um and then so that there's there's four assessments and some of them are about the legislation requirements and health and safety of it, what it is to work with um, within training programs in your own institution. Then we ask the uh, the trainers to create a, a training plan um, from their chosen species. And then a massive part of it is the practical application where they record their training and send us one minute videos and then we can provide formative feedback. And then at the end, we can give them all their evaluative feedback of the of their training program. And their goal is to train a brand new behavior with a species that in their institution that they've that's never tr uh, had that behavior trained before. And it's a really interesting process watching that journey of the animal and the learner together. And then after the 37 weeks, they gain um, accreditation, which is in the form of the um, red, they, they go on to the registered practitioner list for the Animal Behaviour Training Council, which is our national um, institution that standardises training. So we're very lucky to partner with those. And the level four, so the animal training instructor is all about um, coaching and mentoring. So if you've now got the skill set to train your animal, now it's your job to um, build a program within your institution that means that other keepers can, um, can flourish and have their mentorship of the of the animal training instructor so obviously the animal training instructor was developed for the um, companion animal world originally so that was to do with people that um, run puppy classes for example or teach groups of people how to train dogs and that kind of thing and so in the zoo it was really challenging to create a program using the criteria that the a the abtc set knowing that every single zookeeper we train everything from a fish stingray lizard up to elephants and gorillas and everything in between and so it's a really different kind of uh kind of skill set if you like they're all transferable skills the 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 behavior science stuff obviously but the practical side of things can be so different and we certainly aren't really ever in a situation to teach a group of uh trainers with their animals with them in a classroom setting or in a you know in a, in a park and so we had to adapt it and the way we adapted it was by saying uh, you write a curriculum for um, a member of your team or more or a group of people um, and that's um, that's something that we can assess we assess them um, for their um, advanced level behavior science knowledge and then we also ask them to the practical assessment part of it is all about them having someone else video them coaching the trainer that then teaches the animal if that if that if you can if you can sort of visualize that and then we assess that process so it's all about them writing the plan with the mentee then watching them train coaching them one-to-one -one, um, after coaching them in a classroom 
so yeah, we've we've sort of we feel like we've um, we've got a really exciting um, development in terms of animal training in in the UK and Ireland, and um, yeah, and and we start in October, so we'll report back. Yeah, very excited to hear how that goes, and and thanks for sharing all of that. I'm I'm curious with the and just to help everyone out here listening who might not be familiar, the ABTC. Is the Animal Behaviour Training? What does the C stand for? Council. Council. Can you can you just? Yeah. And you might have already said it, but just repeat what that is for those who don't know. Yeah, sure. So the ABTC or the Animal Behaviour Training Council is a government, British government endorsed charity that had was set up about um, fifteen years ago. Um, it's initially it was to it's essentially standardise training and behavior um, technicians or, or um, uh, clinical behaviorists in the UK. There was no um, set of standards or criteria. Anyone could become an animal trainer, an animal training instructor, or, or a clinical um, behaviorist. Um, and so what this did was set a, a clear set of standards that could be followed and several courses that you can take in order to meet those standards. And so what we did in Biaza was we um, we became a practitioner member of the Animal Behaviour Training Council. So there's about 50 odd practitioner members um, of this council. I'll have to double check that number, Brian, <laughs> which I'll do after. There's lots of members of the, of the Animal Behaviour Training Council that are practitioner organisations. And then once you've, um, what you do is you create a course that, um, that, that's, that adheres to the standards that are set by the ABTC. You send it for approval to the council, and then they decide what that you need to change to make that course um, fit in with their standards. And so we did lots of rounds over several years of sending back and forth to get this course 100% right. And we did the same process with the, the level four, the ATI as well. And so we're really confident that um, these standards now and the, the course that we've set um, will help, um, yeah, really push forward training and um, and its welfare implications in zoos in the UK. Already is actually over the last two years. That's very cool. I didn't realise the amount of work that had gone into that. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, and how that has been created with the an already established framework. Exactly. Yeah, we feel like it's a really robust and um, yeah, really. I mean, the, the amount of work it took in terms of getting it over the line. There were many times from when I first went to a, a, a session in um, in the Defra House um, in Westminster um, with with the guys from the ABTC, and from 2015 to when I finally got the course over the line with Joe in 2021. So many times I was like, wow, I'm not sure I can carry on with this. But that's where Joe Mason came in because she's an educator. So she worked in, as an animal training lecturer. And so I had the zoo background and Joe had the education background and that really helped it coalesce. And then we were able to write the course um, with the help of um, many people from the ABTC, Anne McBride and Val Harvey. So, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a journey, Ryan, <laughs> but worth it. Yeah, six years, you said. Yeah, more or less six years, yeah. Amazing. Uh, and just for those listening as well who might not know, uh, can you say what the acronyms that we've been using, BIAZA, because I didn't actually define that in your bio in the end, BIAZA oh, yeah. and, and, and EAZA stand for? Of course. So BIAZA is the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria and EAZA is the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Um, just to make it even more complicated, you can belong to BIAZA and EAZA, but you can also choose one or the other. So it's a uh, it's quite complicated, and they're both um, they both you have to pay to belong to those, but they basically are the umbrella organisations that um, that really do maintain the standards of um, the excellent standards of uh, zoos and aquaria all the way across our region. Just another one more question. I know we're only got like through two of the five things, but for the list for the listeners of this episode who might be in one of those organisations and maybe they have a uh, instructor that's not not gone through your program obviously because of the, the time frame uh, and but they have 
mentorship and then maybe they've got external communities um but but they're 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 still figuring out how to fit training into their routine uh the best way for them and their organization uh, and achieve the goals of training animals building their skill set i'm just thinking about the level three that you talked about and the assignments of submitting the minute long videos and getting feedback and then getting, and the goal is to train a behavior is, is what they're marked on the behavior of their non-human learning partner and them achieving that behavior or is what they're marked on their skill development and, and your observation of them implementing the things they're learning, even if it doesn't result in the end behavior they want? Is it both? And do you have any opinions on that in terms of the listeners of the show and, and kind of where their focus should be on it and, and kind of what goals they should set for themselves and what they should be celebrating as, as they go through this journey? Great question. Um, in terms of the the um, assessment four, which is the practical application one that you've described, there are a set of criteria about 20 of them, uh, performance criteria, uh, they're called from the ABTC. And they include, you know, many things, including setting up the environment for success. They include um, communication skills, motor skills, delivery reinforcement um, systems. They include all, all of the, the kind of practical skill sets that, you, that are important to be a successful animal trainer. Um, what we don't mark them for is what the animal achieves, you know, what the, the end goal behavior. Let's say their training plan was to hand inject a tiger, for example. What we are assessing is their motor skills, their communication, their ability to set the environment up, and, um, you know, empathy, all those things that are really important. It doesn't matter whether the animal is hand injected at the end of that process. That's, um, that's not what we're looking for. Um, when it happens, of course, you know, you can imagine the 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 kind of the feeling that the, the the trainer has it's a really huge approximation for them but it's a, yeah it doesn't matter and in fact i think what your question if i'm right in in kind of taking apart that question a bit it's it's almost leads to what one of the things i think is extremely important when we're training animals in the zoo which is we have so many deadlines and um, pressures to achieve these really high criteria behaviors like blood draws, hand injections, transportation with an animal. And um, often that leads to, you know, which I think is one of the other biggest challenges, if you like, which is these, uh, this feeling of, of, of pressure to deliver. Because what is the alternative? The alternative being that an animal may have to be restrained or may have to be, you know, um, anesthetized if you don't achieve your training goal. And what we need to do as trainers is forget about all that and just think about what is what is the animal how is the animal um showing us it behaviorally what it's feeling in that training session it needs to be have a sense of freedom and choice and control all those things but also essentially to be um to 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 show us that it's enjoying in inverted commas um, that training session and so does the trainer as soon as you start adding in the feeling of delivering expectations that's when i see training sessions and training programs often um fail to succeed in one of their end goals and that doesn't mean that they're failing entirely because everything you do with training with an animal as long as it's um on the you know on the terms of the animal is giving them coping skills and uh, helping them build resilience in their environment I want to see this criteria, <laughs> but I'm assuming it's only available for people to look at who are involved in the program. I can share that one with you, Ryan. And also the ABTC um, standards are available for everyone to see. Um, so yeah, I can, I can share all that. Awesome. Well, share that publicly with the listeners of the show or just... Yeah, with certainly the the ABTC criteria. I'm not. Um, I don't. I don't own the intellectual rights to the course, even though me and Joe wrote it. It actually belongs to Biaza now. Um, but the but certainly the uh, the the standards and the criteria for the ABTC are freely available on their website, which I can share. Oh, awesome! 
I will, and I know that the listeners of this show would be curious to see that. So we'll link to that in the show notes. Hey, so just to wrap up this section, <laughs> run out of time for anything else, but let's wrap up this section. For for the trainers at the zoo with the limited limited time and um, wanting to build their effectiveness with that time, um, what are what are to sum everything up? What are what is three things? What are the three most important things that people can do to combat that limited time and to build their effectiveness? Well, first of all, um, reduce the amount of um, errors in your training by careful antecedent arrangement i think that's the you know i think that covers the, you know, the setting up this this setting up the environment for success is always going to be the most effective solution for reducing errors in your training um more so than even your own skill set and i think you can you know we see that over and over again in in zoos that um effective modification of an environment is the is the single most important part um you know, reason whether you'll succeed or not um but you do need to build your skill set you know those motor skills and simple things like reinforcement delivery and timing are essential and and then just remember to that it's all about quality not quantity so don't feel like you have to train every single day or even you know more than three times a week more effective quality sessions over quantity is going to be the best way to go. And that actually may help you build a routine where you have your rotor at the beginning of the week and say, this is the amount of staff I've got in these these days or the amount of colleagues I'm working with. And you know what? I'm going to train Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week, and I'm going to do it for six minutes on um, at 9 a.m. And if you can build that really easily manageable time into your your weekly routine everyone can do that it doesn't matter how many, how much um ha, what your limits are in terms of um time and staff resource everyone can factor in um 15 minutes a week um so that's the way i would approach that and i bet you what will happen is gradually as you become more effective at managing your time and, and bringing the training programs into your routines you're going to uh, you're going to find a little bit extra time throughout the day to uh, to achieve your goals too I like it. I have more questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I think another thing I'm curious to hear your thoughts on and, and your experience navigating is for a novice trainer, a green trainer, an inexperienced trainer who's trying to uh, work out their routines, their daily routines, and build their effectiveness, uh, how, how, how would you defined for them training in terms of if you've got 15 minutes a, a week right and let's say that's your first approximation to fit that in sometimes it, I feel like maybe people feel that means that they have to be in front of an animal training however they might find that actually they need to prepare the food in the pr- appropriate way they have to collect their resources they have to take their props from wherever they have to go collect the props from wherever they need to be and then they need to take them to their training space and then they need to take it all back and so once you factor in all of those little bits and pieces um, or maybe they need to practice their mechanics with a teammate before they step in front of their animal all these little things they can they can eat up time as well and it's not just um, my personal opinion about being in front of the animal it's there's a there's a lot of that that can often take up the least amount of time when you you plan and you review your session and you use that information plan at your next session and get everything you need. So, well, fifteen minutes a week. Are you talking about for the listeners of the show that they're standing in front of animal training, or or what? How would you define using that fifteen minutes? Yeah, I think that's um, that's a very fair point, and um, I think fifteen minutes is would be the you know, the bare minimum of amount of time that you'd be spending with your animal um, throughout a week. Uh, and yeah, you know, I mean, a five minute, well, but we've been, um, we've been exploring this a bit more with um, some of our species, for example, uh, recently with the gorillas at ZSL London Zoo, where we time it and we time a four minute session. And so we go in and there's um, the trainers ready to go. And I think a lot of that to do, it, you know, the amount of time that you spend 
actually physically training your animal is one part of it, 100%. But you can easily minimize uh, the amount of preparation and, um, you know, debriefing time by setting up your own environment for success, if that makes sense. So, you know, for example, there um, and at the elephants at Whipsnade, we have a whiteboard. And so the whiteboard is a, a very quick visual aid that tells you exactly where you were during the last session. And if you are doing infrequent sessions, it's important to have that visual aid nearby rather than thinking, oh, I've got to look in a diary or those kind of things. So try and simplify the whole process of training. So a whiteboard with your species, your behavior, what you did last time, was there a vet present? Um, you know, what was the you know percentage of criteria that you reached or the step you reached on your training plan? And you can really quickly visualize that. Then you can go and train your animal. And then afterwards, you just whiz back and write that on the whiteboard. Um, we are quite strict with our recording process um, at ZSL particularly. And one of the reasons for that is because um, our legislation in the UK, so our state standards for, for uh, zoo care, um, include this one criteria, which is if you are training your animals, you have to provide um, written records of it. They're not, not really that specific about how you train, just that if you do, you need to record it. And that uh, rec recording becomes quite crucial. So that's something you should have to factor in. But in the modern zoo, we have a, a zoo information management system that simplifies all this. So zookeepers are expected to spend a, you know, a certain amount of time filling in a, a record sheet or a diary at the end of the day or or as you know an electronic database so again it's about you know setting up your own environment for success uh, as long along with setting the animals environment up uh, up for success and having all those tools and equipment uh, to hand and when you're you know um, feeding your animals when you're preparing your diet for the day that's when you would think about what sort of training reinforcers are required for that training session. So, yeah, I think um, maybe I was being a bit optimistic by saying 15 minutes of <laughs> training. Let's say that you could easily get it down to um, just a, a couple of minutes before and a couple of minutes after just to make sure that you've got all those, um, all your equipment to hand. Um, you know, if you want to video it, you've set your video up and, and then you've, you've filled in your whiteboard at the end. Yeah, I, I ask these questions based on my own experience and uh, realizing that a important approximation for a team just getting started or an individual just getting started is uh, identifying the reality of what they want to achieve, what they're trying to achieve and the resources they have to achieve it. And often yeah. the approximations or the goals that are set exceed significantly mm -hmm. the actual resources uh, that are available. For example, yeah. uh, I have a mentor and I have a community and I want them, I want to reach out and ask for help. But then I've realized that I've spent 20 minutes trying to upload my video from my phone to the computer <laughs> <laughs> and I've already gone like way over. Um, so that's kind of why I asked this because I think that uh, that could remove reinforcement for some people starting trying to get started here if they find the clash yeah. between all these things they maybe hadn't thought about. Yeah, I mean, you know, I do think that, like you said before, Ryan, that um, there is a, you know, the trainer is the zookeeper. The zookeeper is a trainer now. They're a researcher. They're, um, you know, there's so much, so many strings to the bow of a, of a zookeeper um, compared to when I started, which we were um, essentially, you know, glorified laborers in a way. You know, we, we've, we've come such a long way. So I do feel like there is, um, you know, even though time is an issue, I do think that it really has to come from the top as well. And it's, you know, we can we can fight all we like from the ground level of wanting to train our animal. But the bottom line is it's go, it has to come uh, on an institutional level. There has to be support for it. And I think that um, as that develops and as training becomes more embedded into our um, zookeeping or zoo management, then then we are, I think there's there's less and less excuses to, you know, from on an institutional level um, to use training as the one thing that you can forget about 
because the servicing of the washing the windows and sweeping up is more important. Um, you know, from a from an animal's point of view, what is more important? Is it more important they are that all their behavioural needs are met, that they are um, they have the opportunity to choose to cooperate in their own care rather than be manually restrained? Or is it more important to, um, you know, wash the windows every day? And so these are the sort of things that, you know, even though I'm trying to find solutions for the individual zookeeper, ultimately, in my opinion, the solution comes from higher up. And that's where the culture change needs to be factored into this, you know, which is another potentially, you know, we could call that another challenge. One of our other challenges, some of the other five challenges, is institutional support and culture. Because, you know, um, we, the way that we did it at ZSL was that we had a group of like minded um, zookeepers across two zoos that were really getting interested in behavior and training. So we created the behavior management committees ab- across two zoos. And these groups of people then, um, you know, we created a network, we communicated, then we shared all of our successes up. And then the management, if you like, started to, to say, well, this is a really interesting thing. We're really enjoying what the keepers are doing. They're clearly having a good time doing it. So we had a, a it was mutually beneficial to management and keepers. And so that is another challenge that can be overcome on the at the grassroots level. You know, you can create that kind of feeling of support and, and networking um, that then ripples out through the through the institution. So even though I'm giving some tips here, you know, of how to minimize the impact in your daily schedule with training, like I say, ultimately there has to be give and take. And from an institutional level, from a you know section manager level, there needs to be um things put in place to make these training training plans succeed and for the listeners of this show it's going to this these thoughts that are generated from what you're sharing here are going to land in different ways for some they're going to say cool i've already got some support from management we already have uh maybe not a formally recognized position in my organization but there are there is this committee that's been set up and they're doing things and i'm getting some assistance for others they're going to be that's me I need to start to form this committee and start to build these relationships. And and I, and I, at at a recent conference could sense at the end, there were a lot of people uh, in that last category and really left wondering what their next approximation was uh, and how to sell this idea. Uh, Do you have anything to offer to those people about approximations for communicating the importance of resource usage to their managers towards training? Yeah, I think um, it comes down to, we are, we know, look, we're really lucky in our community now, Ryan. We've got um, so many groups, you know, there's Zookeepers Europe here. We've got um, the various different taxonomic uh, groups, all social media. It's out there. It's no secret now that um, training is a big part of what we do and that it has um, big impacts in terms of welfare, but also in terms of public perception of the way that we manage our animals and staff um, motivation and development. So I think there's, there's, um, there's all these resources out there that we can tap into. You know, we can share these videos amongst ourselves and we can show these to management. What needs to happen really um, within institutions is is to is to succeed, you know, is to have these success stories that someone is prepared to record and share. And that doesn't have to be, you know, getting up in front of 100 people and presenting. It can be a small blog that's written within a, um, you know, a, a, a newsletter or within like, um, you know, sent out to just the section managers or anything like that, you know, some simple things to, to kind of share the successes that um, the keepers are having. And, but I do think that from my own experience in terms of setting up these um, small groups of people of like-minded people, that is such a great way of, um, of, of getting the message out there. And then 
of course, never underestimate the power of positive reinforcement. You know, if your manager gives you one opportunity to train an animal and um, and you and you've enjoyed it, then share that, and then make sure that they are, if you like basking in the reflected glory of what you've achieved with your animal you know these are really important approximations in that um in that journey if you like towards um uh, cultural acceptance we're going to run out of time to really dive into the other areas that we were going to discuss today but i'm just just curious to end up with if you can maybe share some stories with us Uh, any any that come to mind in terms of uh, how an organisation that you've worked with or an individual keeper might have might have overcome challenges with limited time to uh, get to a successful outcome or found creative ways to overcome hurdles and build their effectiveness as a trainer um, and such, or overcome the hurdles of implementing uh, and growing training programmes within the organisational setting. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, one of the things I, I really needed to talk about was um, one of these challenges, which is to do with participation of animals in training. And um, and this leads me to a really recent example. So there's a, a couple of angles here. One is the fact that in zoos, we're under a lot of different pressures in terms of our commercial viability. So we have lots of people coming to the zoo. So we have seasonal changes. We have a lot of people coming to the zoo in the summer holidays or the Easter holidays. And so animals change, you know, they, they, the way that they participate and the, um, the de- demands, if you like, on them for things like encounters and, and talks and stuff, it increases in those um, peak periods. So that's quite, that's an area where we have to consider. Um, and sometimes the participation in training is um, reduced because of past experiences. You know, that's a really huge part of, um, of zoo life. Animals move from one zoo to another. And so, you know, we, we're trying really hard at ZSL to factor that into an animal's life. And I think we try perhaps a little bit too hard to um, implement training programs when an animal first arrives at the zoo because we want them to settle in as quickly as possible. But just using the basic principle of habituation, which is that obviously decline in reflexive responsiveness, which either happens or doesn't according to the way that the environment's set up, we try and think about that when an animal's first arriving. So rather than us having any contact with the animal, we make sure the environment is right and that we mitigate um, any of those potential aversives and then add them in a controlled way so that then the animal can um, habituate to those stimuli, stimuli um, in, on its own terms, if you like, and we can monitor that um, as we as we kind of progress. Once the animal's settled into a new environment, or you know, or even if it's moved from one to another, or there's a social change, then there's the time to start training rather than before, and that can actually save a huge amount of time with your uh, with your training program. And I'll give you one example, really recent example of that, which is with our um, we had a, uh, some warthogs arrive from uh, Colchester Zoo recently, and they. Uh, They'd previously been really well trained. They came into our collection. Um, but because they're in a new environment, um, of course, they're kind of wary. That's the nature of a, a newly arrived animal. And um, my colleague, Jess, um, that I was working with on the program, was really trying hard to um, connect with these animals um, by feeding them in their outside space. And they just weren't prepared to accept appetitives at that time. So we did a very simple bit of um, of the of, of negative reinforcement. So looking for calm behavior and then backing off and then approaching a bit more and then waiting for calm behavior backing off until within two training sessions, they were accepting appetitives at which point we could walk away and then um, stay with them. And so that quick transition between giving them distance, which is what they really wanted in that moment, um, because that's what they were wary of, um, was was us people. We managed to get that positive reinforcement program started um, within, you know, two training sessions on one day. So again, a really recent example of, um, you know, using all of the operant conditioning, you know, <laughs> the realm of operant conditioning in order to to save time and achieve our goals as quickly as we possibly could. And, um, and you know, there's, there's tons of other examples of um, where uh, individual keepers of, 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 you know, really made a huge difference in terms of their training programs by creative solutions, particularly in the antecedent realm. So, 
building the right thing, the right set of transport boxes or um, or changing a way that an environment is set up to allow a, a primate to be above you. All these kind of things make such a big difference in your training. And, um, and of course, you know, in a zoo, particularly somewhere like London Zoo, that's, you know, 100 and uh, well, nearly 200 years old now and um, we have those um specific environmental challenges where we're in old buildings that can't be touched and so we, we we face a lot of these different challenges and it is about creativity you know zookeepers are extremely creative people when it comes to um solving problems with their animals that's for sure well thank you so much for sharing all of that jim we Touched on at least three, limited time, the effectiveness of the trainer and initial institutional, sorry, support and culture. Um, so I appreciate all of your insights. Uh, I was curious if now you could let, let the listeners know uh, where they can go online to find out more about the things you've talked about today, about you, uh, get in touch. Uh, and I think you've got some exciting events happening that we haven't talked about thus far. Do you want to share about those? Oh, yeah, sure. So we've got, um, you know, talking about reducing errors in our training. We were talking about that at the beginning, weren't we? Making ourselves a bit more effective upskilling. Um, we've um, we've got a, a symposium, a zoo animal training symposium, which we're um, partnering with the Yorkshire Wildlife Park up in Doncaster in the UK. And that's going ahead on the 11th and 12th of November this year. Um, and we're inviting anyone with an interest in zoo animal training. So um, ordinarily up to now, we've focused on our BRs of colleagues or our ERs of colleagues. This is for everybody. So we've actually got quite a lot of interest in the companion animal world. Um, a few of the ABC, uh, sorry, ATA members are coming as well, which I'm really excited about. And um, we've got Annette Peterson from um, Copenhagen Zoo. So she's the ERs of training working group chair who's um my hero in the in the zoo community in terms of the training programs and a fantastic trainer and she's going to teach us all about um the work that she does in copenhagen reducing errors in her training programs we've got um shirag patel the wonderful shirag who's going to be joining us um and uh, helping us with a lot of the um the, the the overall weekend as well which is great because he's there for the whole weekend and we've got susan friedman online um, who's going to join us live from Utah at about um, three o'clock in the morning in order to do the keynote address on the first day, um, which is all about introducing the subjects of errorless learning and what we can do there. And then there's myself, Joe Mason from Biaza, Kim Wilkins, who's the Biaza Animal um, Paper Training Working Group Chair, um, who's also going to be contributing. Plus, we've got um, Rob Ellis from the Guide Dogs, who's going to give us a presentation too. So really exciting. Plus, we get to see... Um, some amazing training live, including with polar bears. So that's going to be a pretty awesome event. We're really looking forward to that. And where can people go to find out more about that? So um, what I will do is put a poster up on the site and then um, and then with a link to it, because that's basically um, you just follow a link to um, to a ticketing link. There isn't a website set up specifically for that event. Cool. So I'll include that in the show notes for this episode. And if anyone wanted to reach out to you, Jim, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So um, obviously through the uh, if you, the ATA, um, I'm, I'm you know I love being seeing all the 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 amazing content that is created by your members. I'm I don't contribute to all of it, but I'm fascinated by everything. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, I'm on there. So please reach out and then um, feel free to, to email me as well. And I'll give you my, uh, my personal email address and put that on the, um, on the show notes too. Perfect. Perfect. Well, this has been a pleasure to have you on the show again today, Jim, on behalf of everyone at Animal Training Academy and our listeners, we appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you once again and keep doing the amazing work you are doing, inspiring ripples and positive change in animal behavior management. Thank you. Ryan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, can't wait to come back. And thank you as well so much for listening. This is your host, Ryan Cartledge, signing off from this episode of the Animal Training Academy podcast show. It's our hope today's conversation sparked inspiration and added some tools to your trainer's toolbox. Remember, every training challenge is an approximation towards becoming a better trainer. Embrace the rough patches, learn from them, and keep improving. 
And don't forget, the path to growing your skills and expanding your knowledge continues beyond this episode. Visit www.atamember.com to join our waitlist and be the first to know when our membership doors open again. There you'll find a supportive community of trainers just like you, working to make a positive difference in the lives of animals and humans alike. Until next time, keep honing your skills, stay resilient, and remember, every interaction with an animal or human learner is your opportunity to create ripples. We're here cheering you on every step of the way. See you at the next episode.